Um, well, thank you guys for coming. Welcome to CypherCon. My name is Joe Grand. Um, this talk is, is pretty interesting to me because I normally give technical talks and we'll go a little bit into my background. Um, but when Michael invited me and the theme was the 80s tele retro telefreaking, you know, historical sort of nostalgia, I was like, okay, well, let's think of something a little bit differently than I've spoken about in the past because I'm normally a computer engineer. I'm a hardware hacker. I've been doing this for my entire life, as you'll see. I'm a runner, I'm a daddy, um, but I was like, what if I put together a presentation that talks about the time where nobody knows about, uh, except for maybe a few stories that my wife knows, but most people don't. Um, so this presentation is something that's not really meant to be a bio, um, but it talks about some tales of the olden days, of the 80s and the 90s of hacking and freaking and juvenile delinquency and sort of messing around and exploring in a time where there weren't a lot of rules, or I guess there were, um, but well, I just didn't listen to them. Um, so it it's really goes along with the theme, as you'll see with the hacking and the freaking. And um, like Michael says in the, brochure, in, the, in the conference program about nostalgia, like it's great to hear all these old stories, but then it's important to take those old stories and say, okay, well, what can you apply to newer stuff? So my goal is not to just stand up here and tell you how bad I was as a kid, um, which is pretty embarrassing. Uh, but to get you to be inspired of like, okay, well, I, maybe I can still do this, even though things are different now and there's new laws and new things, there's also new technology and there's new villages and there's new opportunities to do the stuff where I didn't have the same opportunities early on. So it's still, you know, still using that hacker mindset just in a way that isn't gonna get you thrown in jail. Um, so my story really, I don't think is that much different from people that grew up in the, in the early 80s and, and the, or mid 80s, um, and early 90s who were involved in computers. Um, I got my first computer when I was seven years old in 1982 and was just infatuated with it. And I think it's important that um, you know, people share these stories. And that's, again, w why I'm doing this because that's sort of this lost era of the hacker world before it became what it is now. Um, and a lot of, you know, everyone has a past, right? Everybody has stories, but not a lot of people actually want to admit what they've done in the past. And I think that's an important thing to, first of all, because it's fun. Um, second of all, because I, I finally wanted to say this stuff, but just so everybody can have a say in what that history was really like. So anyway, um, so pretty much everything you're gonna see has never been shown before, and some of it's very embarrassing, um, but I just found this stuff and I was like, this is cool. So yeah, like I said, I got my first computer in 1982. Um, I have an older brother who's six years older than me, and he was involved in computers. So he was 13 and he had an Atari 400, um, and we basically would play games and collect games and, and use bulletin board systems to, you know, talk to other people. Uh, but he decided to become a musician uh, and gave all of his computer stuff to me, which was awesome. Uh, around that same time, he was also involved in electronics. And for me, I would like do a chore for him. I would, you know, clean his, clean his room or bring his laundry upstairs or whatever it was. And he would let me pick a piece of electronics from his junk box. So it was like this amazing thing. And really without him, I would never have been exposed to, to this world at all. Um, so yeah, this is me in, in uh, let's see, I was eight. So I guess second grade or something like that. And already that's an Atari 400 for those who don't know. Um, the retro gaming village in that room. I don't know if it has an Atari, but it has this era of stuff. So imagine a bunch of kids using that stuff in that room. Um, I, was a, I was a latchkey kid. I had a normal middle class upbringing. So a lot of you might wonder as we start going through this, like how did he dive, how did he get over there? Like he had normal parents and normal school and everything, but something just clicked with the hacker world and as you'll see with some other stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, was, uh, I spent a lot of time with my computer. It was a way for me to just discover um, lots of things on my own. It was really fun. And back then, if you had a computer, it was something where you were either really lucky, like I was, um, or your parents maybe were involved in, you know, some academia or, or research or something that required a computer. It wasn't like it was today. And it was really something where if you had a computer, like you were sort of a weirdo already. Um, this one was age 10. So around 1985, um, I still have that computer. And uh, yeah, so television, I had a terminal program running on here, XE term, which was the terminal program. My modem you can't see. But I'm guessing by 85, I had a 1200 baud modem, maybe. Most of my early days were using a 300 baud acoustic coupler modem, which there's an acoustic coupler in the other room also, which is awesome. Um, and this was, a, this was an age where 
I was doing a lot of game collecting and playing games, and that's really why I use the computer. Um, what ended up happening is when you're collecting games, and I've heard this story from other people too, is you're collecting games, you want to then find other games that are outside of your region. So I could call local calls within the Boston area where I'm from, um, but I wanted to connect to other bulletin board systems because places in California or New York, like they had cooler games, or at least that was sort of the, the thought process. Um, so we had to call those, those numbers. Um, I originally was just dialing long distance and had to pay for it, but being a 10 year old, like that wasn't a very, you know, useful thing to do because I wasn't making that much money. Uh, I think I just was getting allowance. Um, but I found uh, a code written on one of my brother's floppy disks that was one of the codes that you could use from various services that actually would let you use to place calls. Um, so sort of like a, cor usually they're like a corporate code. You'd have an 800 number that you would dial, you'd enter some six digit pin, and then you could get access and call long distance wherever you wanted in the country, um, which it turns out is illegal. Uh, <laughs> what did I know? Um, actually, I probably already knew, but I didn't care. The quest was to get the games and connect to other bulletin board systems. So it just happened, just like, you know, I never would have been introduced to electronics and computers if it wasn't for my brother. I wouldn't have gotten into the freaking side of things either. So it's really all his fault. Um, so I found one on, on his, on his, uh, on the floppy disk, and that sort of set the stage of things to come. Once I realized that I could go to other bulletin board systems and, and start communicating with other people, the hacker world at that time was still very localized. So you had groups of people in Boston, in New York, in California, in, in the Midwest, um, in Texas, but there wasn't this real connection. But then with bulletin board systems, everybody was using codes to get access to, you know, for, for free long distance. It's just what it was. And I think some of the older guys at the time were like, we're gonna fight the man, the telephone shouldn't be so expensive, we're gonna do it for free. Um, but I think most of us were just doing it because it was convenient. So I, I got a little bit into software for a very brief second. I'll tell you one story that sort of pushed me back into hard work. Back into hard work for good. Did we just lose this? Oh, okay. Um, so this is a program that I wrote when I was uh, seven or eight, and some of you might recognize what it is. It's called Electric Dog. I found this program, it's in BASIC. Um, and uh, so here it is, little loading screen. Can, can anyone guess what that is? It was on the label, which you might not be able to see. That was K9 from Doctor Who. And it looks just like him for an eight year old or whatever. Um, so yeah, so I did a little, pro a little bit of programming and actually taught myself hexadecimal by hacking or modifying the binary of somebody else's cracked game, because you know they have the cracked screens on there that says cracked by whatever. I would change that and make it say Joey Grand or, or Black Ninja, which is what I was at the time. So just sort of experimenting and I was like, oh, if I just change these values in this hex editor program, it changes the, the thing. So it was pretty cool. I never got into software cracking because most of my kind of passion was in hardware. I found this just the other day looking for pictures and stuff. My first handle was Black Ninja when I was seven, um, which is hilarious because when my son turned seven, the first name he gave himself was Black Ninja. And I realized, huh, I think every seven-year-old likes ninjas. <laughs> and if they're Black Ninjas, it's even cooler because they're more mysterious or something. Um, so it sounded cool, but this was my list of all the games that I'd collected over time and they were all numbered and you know very anally organized. Um, I had other names too, Astro Zombie, Otto Vaughn, FBI agent, and ultimately settled on Kingpin. Um, so at the time, besides being involved in computers, which was a bad thing to be at the time, I got involved in punk rock and hardcore. Um, woo um, so this was 1989, I was 13 years old, and uh, so I would basically spend either all of my time using a computer and the rest of the time just being a complete mischievous, whatever you wanna call it outside of that. Um, and this is, this is what's sort of interesting, and I still haven't been able to figure this out. I'm 42 now, and this was a long time ago, and I'm still drawn to that sort of subculture of music and the counterculture of everything. Um, and I still haven't figured out, like, I had a normal upbringing. I, you know, we didn't have the struggles that a lot of people that get into punk rock do, um, but I'm still attracted to that world. So I don't know, this combination was dangerous. Um, and this is when I sort of knew, like, okay, it, like, I'm normal, everyone else is not normal. Like that's, that's how I sort of took it. Um, also at the time, which I think is important to sort of see this progression um, kind of happen is after discovering punk rock, which was all about, you know, fuck everything up. Um, I, I started in high school, there's a lot of peer pressure to drink, 
right, and do drugs and go to parties and all of this stuff. And I was like, this is stupid. Like, I just want to use my computer. I don't want to do that stuff. So I rebelled against that as well um, and discovered Straight Edge, which really was my kind of direction for a long time, which was involved in the kind of punk and hardcore music scene of like, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to do drugs. I'm going to be a vegetarian. I'm going to have this clean, you know, positive kind of mindset and, and clean mind. So while I was like this very almost, you know, people would make fun of me for being like a goody two shoes. They had no idea what I was doing, you know, with my sober, clean mind when I wasn't around other people. Um, and I'll show you some, some examples. And then skateboarding also. So this is like the trifecta of things you didn't want to be in the 80s uh, because you would get your ass kicked. Um, and this was something where I was tormented emotionally, so people would make fun of me all the time, you know, whatever it was. I had friends that I would skateboard with and stuff um, who were not technical people, so we'd go into Boston and we'd get made fun of and we'd get into fights and we'd get beat up. And um, it was just like this really weird thing. And then having a computer was the same thing. Like people in school would be like, oh, you nerd, you, you know, fat, whatever, like all of these things that really hurt. Um, and my sort of response to that was like, okay, well, that gave me this thick skin of like, well, I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do and I don't care what anyone says, and that has sort of followed on for a long time. So that's a theme, actually, of this whole thing, is like, do what you want to do no matter what other people say. Um, and I think that ended up being both good and bad for me, as you'll probably see. So some of these stories I talk about freaking, I talk about um, kind of credit card fraud and stuff that, you know, seemed normal to me at the time. Actually, it still seems normal to me, as bad as that is. Um, but I have to sort of preface it with, I was sort of just one generation of hackers, so before me, of course, there, you know, people had been exploring technology way before. I was just one piece of that you know, lineage. Um, so I, I thought this one was cool. This was the um, uh, picture of Marconi in his lab in 1903, and he had given a demonstration uh, to show off the first Morse code transmission, right? So wireless, I don't know if it was a spark gap transmitter or whatever it was. What are you saying to the press? And tell me how this is so relevant to today in InfoSec even. Um, he said, I have this new system. I'm gonna show you that we can wirelessly communicate data. Totally insecure, nobody can hack it. And um, there was a guy in, an Italian guy, I don't know how to say his name, Neville Mas Mascaline, um, who is a magician, and he was like, well, that's bullshit. Like, I know how this system works, I'm gonna hack it. So he ended up, um, <laughs> when Marconi was giving his demonstration, he sent his own messages over Morse code to the receiver saying like, he was saying rats, R-A-T-S, rats, rats, and then he said some poem making fun of Marconi, which was like so awesome. Um, just that hacker ethic from 1903, right? So it's like anything we do that we think is interesting, we're just standing on the shoulders of other people. Uh, so that was really pretty cool. Oh yeah, so actually the story that he started with, it says there was a young fellow of Italy who diddled the public quite prettily. <laughs> so there've been trolls for a long time also. <laughs> Um, other stuff too, so Esquire Magazine, October 1971, um, was an article that inspired a whole generation of people. And before this, you know, people had been exploring telephone networks through MIT, through other, other universities, um, you know, making free phone calls and um, phone freaks, or phone pranks that, you know, calling people, using the blue box to gain access to the phone network and travel around using multi-frequency tones and stuff like that. So there was already this culture of telephone exploration by the time I got involved and sort of just took advantage of all of it. Um, there was actually a, uh, a letter to the editor that I found from this article, and this guy says, it says so much about our relationship to our technology, the union of isolated spirits through electronics, the computerized craziness of our times. And that was 1971. So just, you know, you can already, you see that similarity even to this day where everyone's like, there's too much technology, but technology brings us together still. But that paranoia was there earlier. So I, I just think it's really interesting. But I think also that Marconi example is like, you know, what we do at hacker conferences, we'll find vulnerabilities and talk about them. And it's what, 115 years later, and we're still doing the same thing. And then I would be remiss to not mention the 414s being in Milwaukee. Um, are there any 414s here? Because I heard there were last year, right? Okay, I was hoping there would be. Um, so yeah, this was a group, and there's actually some, some um, Wisconsin history section over, over there at the conference. Uh, they were a group that actually met through IBM's Explorer Club, which was hosted by the Boy Scouts to let people explore computers. Um, and they ended up breaking into all sorts of computer systems that were connected over the modem. And uh, really were the first, I would say, the first publicly known hacker group and it was just a group of 
16 to 22 year old kids. Um, but that was like a really interesting time. And then War Games came out and that inspired more people. Uh, we had like the Legion of Doom, um, LOD, Masters of Deception, MOD, hacker groups, sometimes warring with each other, trying to one up each other of like, can we listen on people's cell phone call or cell, normal phone, uh, landline calls? Can we, you know, hack the, the um, whatever ESS, I don't remember what version, can we hack the ESS switch to listen on phone calls and do all of this stuff? Um, Kevin Mitnick, of course, Kevin Poulsen, who had hacked uh, various radio stations, hacked phone lines so he could be the only person to dial in to win the Porsche. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> people were doing this stuff. Um, so I definitely wasn't that first generation of hackers, but I will say, I think that, that I was part of the last generation that got to do what we did um, before the mainstream got involved in it and a lot of the laws changed. So it was, a, it was a little bit like, yes, it was illegal at the time, but it wasn't totally enforced. And I knew people that got in trouble, myself included, but it wasn't like it is today. The world is much different. Um, okay, so let's see some stories. Um, so one of the, besides collecting games, what ended up happening is after collecting games, that sort of evolved into, as I got older, it's like, okay, well, playing games is all right. I realized I'm like not a good game player, um, but I still loved technology and I loved communicating with other people and I loved the bulletin board systems. Um, what I ended up doing is a lot more of like war dialing. So saying, okay, I know these phone numbers are known BBSs. What if I use a war dialer program to try every single number of, uh, you know, this prefix? And so I would dial 10,000 different numbers. Usually you'd let the program run overnight. You needed a direct dial modem. You couldn't do it with an acoustic coupler. And you'd wake up in the morning and you'd have a list of phones, of, of phones that phone numbers that were modems. Uh, so then you could go through and connect to things. And it was really such an easy process. It's sort of like if you have your badge now, there's actually a war dialer program in your badge. So you can connect up to your USB port, hook it up to the phone line and war dial the telephone network that's up in the other room too and sort of get that feeling of what it's like. Um, and you could do it manually as well. You could just sit there and dial, you know, 555 000, 555 000, over and over again and see what you get. You'd hang up on a lot of people, um, but then if you connected to a modem, then it would keep track of that. So that's how you would discover systems. And even if they were passworded, that's just the next step, right? Just finding the computers. It's, so it's like a port, like a scan now on the internet, right? See what ports are open of different things using Shodan to see what IoT devices are connected. So um, just a, this was just slower. So it sort of evolved into not the trading games, but trading codes and trading phone numbers of things that I had war dialed versus, you know, with somebody else who had war dialed something else. Um, and it just became this gathering of information. I was like a, a, a hoarder of information. Um, not necessarily to use it all, but just to have it. And I thought that was really neat. Some bulletin board systems too also had secret sections. So you had like the game trading sections, if you could get to those, but there was also other sections sometimes that would be like the hacker side. And then you could trade codes and do all of this other stuff. Um, inside of the book, this was the first page of my first book, which was the red one. There was three of them. They get more and more nefarious as the years go on. Um, but this, I was, I was not even 15 when I started this. So I was just fascinated with like, what phone numbers could you call and what could they do? And um, log in usernames and passwords for various systems. I didn't even know what the systems were, but just to be able to go and explore and, and connect to them. It's sort of like with lock picking now, right? Lock picking village is huge because having that power to unlock something, even if you never use it to break into something, it's just like really cool. Um, except I did end up using this stuff to break into things. Um, so let's see, some of the, some of the, the early stuff, you know, bulletin board systems, um, trading information, I did a lot of telephone kind of centric goofing around. So there, I did connect to various computer systems that I shouldn't have. I'll talk about one of them later. Um, but I just loved using the phone and you could really fuck with people on the phone. Uh, so I actually found a recording of my, my first, my, not my first, but one of my earliest recorded prank calls. I just turned 14. Um, some of you guys might get insulted, so sorry. <laughs> uh, so it was Christmas time, and being who I am, said, well, Christmas is what? It's like Jesus' birthday, right? So I'm gonna look up people named Jesus in the white pages, and then call him up and wish him happy birthday. So, so um, let's see. I'll try to play it, see if you can hear it. So, 
<laughs> my voice hadn't changed yet. Could you hear it in the back? Yeah, okay. So, you know, just stuff like that. That was fun. Um, what, what we would also trade are um, <laughs> our voicemail systems. So one way that hackers would exchange information back in the day before the internet, um, besides bulletin board systems and besides meeting in person, which once in a while happened, uh, mostly around trading games and stuff, is through hacked voicemails. And you would find a voicemail box somewhere, you'd call an 800 number, somebody might say, hey, this is a voicemail for my dad's work. Um, you'd call that, and you'd hack somebody's voicemail password, which normally is gonna be like 0000 or 1234, actually not that much different than today, um, <laughs> except this was 30 years ago. So you would hack their voicemail system, you'd use that as a way to share information with other people. You'd say, okay, here's my list of stuff that I know, leave a message with stuff you know, I'll go share that, that gets relayed over here, and you have this network of people communicating over other people's voicemail. And then you get, you know, the, the legitimate user after the weekend or something comes back and says, wait a second, someone's hacked my thing, so they change the password and they leave a voicemail of like, this number, you can't use this anymore, it's my voicemail, and, uh, and then you just go find another voicemail. So this recording, um, I ended up finding a whole bunch of tapes that Whisker from the Toymakers digitized for me. Um, all of them are now up on archive.org, if you search for Kingpin voicemail collection, there's a whole list of uh, voicemail systems. I'm, I'll just play one that's one of my favorite that's sort of a short one. Um, and you can just sort of get a feeling of like what types of stuff were out there. And you can tell by his voice that he was just another kid doing this stuff. So really cool. So here we go. Please enter your three-digit extension number now. So you can see he started off with a bunch of codes for doing free long distance and then threw a credit card in there, which of course, if a bunch of hackers get that, that's gonna be used very quickly. I'll talk a little bit about credit card stuff. Um, and then another voicemail box to call to. So it was like this web. And I don't know who that guy is. I would love to meet him. Cause that was like, when I recorded that, I was like, this guy is so cool. Cause I was even younger than that. And I was like, this guy's awesome. I wonder where he lives, but I had no idea. Um, because of using the codes that I was using, uh, which were 1-800 numbers, and I don't exactly know how traceable those were at the time and, and all of that, um, you know, doing crank calls and the voicemail hacking and everything. I was really paranoid about who was calling my house. And uh, so I created a, a, a board, which I'll show you later on, that was called a ring busy device. And it was a resistor, just a single resistor that would go in line between the ring and the tip of the telephone line. And that would still let you dial out so my parents could use the phone. But if somebody tried to call the house, uh, they would get a busy signal. Actually, it would ring once and then be a busy signal. So that would prevent these companies from calling and complaining and you know having my teachers call and complain about whatever I did that day. Um, and it actually worked. I used it for a long time. And I don't actually know if my parents know that. So now you do, because they want to watch this. I warned them they probably shouldn't watch this presentation, but I think they will. 
Um, so I got a phone call one day, and I always recorded every phone call, which is also illegal, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I recorded this one, so see if you can notice, like, what's going on. Hey, you're busted, man. Healing down long distance service. Excuse me? Yeah. Excuse me? Who's, this? Who's calling, please? Huh? Who's calling, please? Secret Service, Federal Department. Uh, can I please have your name? I think you might have the wrong number. No, we show this number, 617. That's my phone number. I guess that is the number. Okay, thank you. We're just confirming that. So, that was sort of hard to hear, but this guy called me out of the blue and he was like, you're busted. But he was obviously also pretending to be somebody else because Secret Service doesn't have a federal department. They are a federal department. Um, but it still freaked me out. And you could hear like, what I did a lot of times too is people called me Mickey Mouse growing up because my voice was so high like you heard in that other video. Um, so I would try to be like, hello, this is, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. But I still had a high voice. So that was me trying to sound older, um, which you'll hear on the next one too, which I don't, know, I don't understand how people even believe this stuff. Uh, especially when I started when I started actually like ordering things with credit cards, and I'm like, hello, I would like to order this video camera to my house. Um, yeah, so having a high voice didn't work out too well. So one of the things also that a lot of people, a lot of hackers did was do what are called alliance teleconferences. And these were teleconference systems that were run by AT&T, and businesses would use them, sort of like a conference call now or whatever people use, Skype or I don't even know what what people use for conference calls, Slack. No, you can't do voice with Slack. I don't know, whatever it is, right? Three-way calling for lots of people. So it was a conference call system. I think it was $5 per minute per line that was on the conference call. Um, a lot of these, actually a lot of Alliance Teleconference recordings, I had some, but they were inappropriate to post to archive.org and inappropriate to play here. Um, but some of them are on archive.org from other people that you hear all these hackers, like legendary hackers on the phone um, messing with people, because you basically have a giant group conference. It's like IRC for, for voice. Um, and the way you would start these systems is whoever calls in to start the teleconference pays the fee, pays the money. Um, so you weren't gonna do that from your house. You might be able to do it through other ways of getting access to some, like through PBX to get access to an out dial that would call out. Um, but what I would do is, since I lived in Boston, I would hop on my bike, ride down into the city, into like an alleyway. I had my lineman handset, take off the cover of one of the phone junction boxes that covered like all the apartments in the back, clip onto one of those, hope no one was on the phone at the time, I'd get a dial tone, start the conference, and then transfer control of the conference to a friend of mine, and then unclip, ride my bike home, and then the conference would be running for 12 hours at a time. Uh, and we'd call everybody, people from around the, uh, usually local, but also, other, other places too, because like I had my friends and they might knew, know somebody in New York, let's call him. This guy likes a girl in California that they met at camp, let's call her. And it was like this totally ridiculous thing that would go on for hours and hours and hours. And for those of you who remember having phones, right, like I'm sure everybody in here who's my age, or maybe slightly younger and definitely older, like spent time on the phone with like somebody you liked and you'd lie in bed and you'd talk on the phone for a while and like, it, you would do that for hours and hours. And like my ear would turn red and it was just so fun. Um, so we would, we would call party lines. Like at the time there were actually legitimate party lines. So one 900, whatever. And you would call those and, and it would be like a, um, I don't even know what a good example is, you know, uh, a forum for whatever sex or I don't know, whatever, you know, stuff. Um, so we would call those. And then like just screw with whatever, you know, we pretend to be that type of person or whatever, um, which was just totally horrible. Uh, we would also call girls that we liked and sometimes prank, prank call girls that we liked because we didn't know how to actually communicate with people that we liked at the time. Um, so we would call them or like we'd have somebody call up and be like, hey, is this, uh, is this Samantha? And they'd be like, yeah, Samantha. Uh, Joe says hi, click, you know, and like. <laughs> Just stuff like that. And then sometimes we'd just bring on, we'd call people. And the thing is like, there was no caller ID. Your house phone would just ring. And so someone's parent would answer and hello. It's like, is Bill there? And then we'd talk to Bill for four hours. So it was just chaos. Um, one time I remember I was in New York working and I got a phone call from, uh, from one of my friends who was on a conference. We decided to connect directory assistance operators from all over the country together. Because uh, you know, you would call 411 to get directory assistance, but you could also call a local number for each of those areas to connect to directory assistance. So we brought them all into the conference and then we all stopped talking. Um, <laughs> and 
they, you know, at first they're like, hello, Kentucky Director of Assistance, how can I help you? And someone else is like, California Director of Assistance. And they're like, what's going on? This is really weird. And then they just all start talking. <laughs> so it's like, we're bringing people together by, by screwing with them. And I, and I don't remember how long they were on the phone for, but it was hilarious. Uh, so imagine, you know, 20 people on the phone for eight hours, 12 hours at a time, $5 a minute. It was not cheap. Um, and companies did not like that. Uh, also, AT&T did not like that. So they started doing their own investigations into misuse of stuff. So I got a phone call one day. Um, again, another reason why the Ring Busy device was good. Uh, my parents weren't, weren't home during the day, so I could turn it off and see who's gonna call me. Uh, I got a phone call and the, the, the person on the other end started naming every single name and phone number of, or every single name of people that were on the conference call. And there were names of people I didn't even know because we were all using handles. Uh, but it was every name, and I was like, oh my god, we're so screwed. Um, so you can hear me trying to act very, like, well, very innocent. June 18th at 9.56 in the evening. June 18th. Um, see, I don't have any idea. It was a conference call. A conference call. Involving uh, a bunch of different numbers, you know, so that a lot of people would be on the same call. Um, no, I have no idea. I don't have triple on the... No, you said it originated from your phone. It was originated from a number in Clarksville, Tennessee, and they, you know, included all the other numbers so that the charges weren't on your bill at all. Um, so I don't know anyone from Tennessee. Is this, you know, if this is some kind of mistake or... I don't know. If, well, the calls weren't billed to your phone, and they won't be. That you're not responsible in any way for them. I'm just trying to find out who initiated the, the call. If I give you names, can you tell me if you recognize them? Um. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll try. I'll see what I can do. Uh, uh nope. Yeah. Is there a California? Uh, no. From Florida, Tennessee. Imagine my fear after that lady just naming every single person that was on the conference call, asking if I was the only person to answer that phone. So I went ahead and then started calling people and were like, I just got a call from the Alliance operator. Um, but that was sort of the that kind of stress you lived under doing this stuff. And um, ultimately, I never got in trouble for, for Alliance stuff, um, which was good. <laughs> so here's one that um, was a friend of mine was war dialing and apparently Somebody answered the phone, and you, you wore dialing you normally do at night, right, while you're sleeping. Um, so somebody answered the phone, and uh, she got pretty angry and left a message for him. So here, this one might be a little loud, um, so just, I tried to turn it down. She was really angry. Uh, <laughs> but so you'll see, you'll see this. I can imagine that happening all over the country 
all the time because the word dialers were going and people would answer. Um, oh, it makes me nervous just hearing it. So yeah, you know, we were indirectly affecting people. Not that I feel bad about it, but it was sort of funny. <laughs> um, so this one's a little bit of RF radio hacking. So this is something, you know, we have software defined radios now. We have lots of methods of um, manipulating wireless systems. Uh, what we used to do back in the day, this was November, around November 1992, is, you know, we had ham radios and um, ham radios will transmit in a defined range. So I had a two meter ham radio, I think it was 144 to 146 or something, some ham, ham people will know. Um, but I had modified my radio as an ICOM 2 SRA to transmit in a, at a wider band. So I could transmit from 138 to 174 megahertz or something, which violates the FCC rules and I'll probably get my ham radio license taken away now because I'm admitting to doing it. Uh, but we would modify the, the transmit frequency outside of that range and it just so happens that maybe even still to this day, I'm not sure, that the fast food drive through windows, the speakers were all wireless, which meant you could transmit to the people inside wearing the headsets that are taking your order, or you could transmit out the speaker and really screw with people. Um, so this is one where I was in the car with a friend of mine. This one's really hard to hear, so I'll sort of explain it at the end. Um, but we're sitting you know, in the parking lot, but a little further away. We see a guy come up and he starts his order, and then we jump in and sort of harass. Um, <laughs> so here we go. So the loud voice obviously was us transmitting over the radio. And at the beginning, there's a guy that's like, I want three quarter pounders with cheese. And we're like, we want 20 Big Macs. And you can hear him go, no, not that many. <laughs> and then he drives away and then we're still harassing them and we're not even there. And we got to the point where we would do it and it's like, can you come to the window? Who's at the window? And it's like, I don't have any arms or legs. I can't get to, it was just horrible. <laughs> so anyway, that was just some of the mischief um, that we did. And like I said, like this stuff just felt normal. It was playing around with stuff and just being a punk juvenile delinquent kid. Um, what I also got into was cloning cell phones. And this was later on, but because of my fascination with technology and with electronics, um, cell phones at the times that were on the AMPS network would use ESN and MIN pairs, the electronic serial number and a mobile identification number. If you had that pair, you could program that into other phones and then use that and then those phone calls would get billed to the, to the ESN MIN account. Um, so it was actually really easy with certain types of phones to load your own ESN and MIN pairs in, and then you could use that for a day or two, call 900, you know, porn numbers and um, call, call your friends and everything and not get billed and then change to another one. Um, I ended up selling those in high school, which was a good way to, to make money, but I found myself in like really sketchy areas of town, you know, in like projects and... I'm um, like this sort of chubby white kid and selling phones to people that were friends of friends of other people. Um, but it was actually sort of fun and a good way to get money that I could then go buy electronics and other stuff with. Um, so that's sort of a side thing. Um, but just another example of like this sort of craziness that came out of this hacker world. 
Um, I do have one request that a friend of mine requested. I tell this story that isn't exactly technical related, but a little bit of physical security. Um, so I grew up in Boston. The public transit system there is called the MBTA, so the train system there, um, where besides just hanging on the back of the train to get free train rides, which was fun, um, it wasn't very safe. So one of the other things that we would do, especially if the train was full, the train is like, I don't know how to explain, it's like a bi-directional train. So you have the conductor's booth at both ends. So when the train turns around, the conductor goes to the other side and gets to the other track and keeps going. So the conductor's in the front of the train driving the train. That means the back conductor booth is open and empty. And when the train is full and you're surrounded by Bostonians who are just naturally mean anyway, <laughs> myself included, um, I wanted a nice, plush, comfortable seat to sit in. It turns out that the locks on those doors were one type of skeleton key. I don't remember what type, but I grew up in an old house that had lots of skeleton keys, so I just took a bunch and tried each one until it worked. Um, if you didn't have a skeleton key, you could just use a credit card as a shim to push the latch out of the way to get in. Um, so then you'd go and sit, you'd push everyone out of the way, you'd go sit in the back of the train and get your ride in comfort. Uh, but then that was sort of boring, because now you're sitting there just looking out the back of the train. Um, so what we decided to do is like, oh, we can control everything from the back of the train also. Uh, we didn't try to drive it or anything, which now, now that I'm thinking about it, would have been actually really funny. Um, but you could do like the bell, you know, like the warning as they cross over the tracks, ding, ding, ding. Um, so we would do that. We'd sometimes honk the horn, and then we see the button for PA. It's like, oh, yeah. Um, so what we would do is like, um, we'd use the PA, and we'd be like, you know, next stop is the last stop on this train. Sorry, everybody has to get out. And then you hear everyone go, ah. Oh. Um, and then the train would go, Err! and the driver would stop and like in the middle of the train tracks and then run down the thing to try to get in. Sometimes we had friends on the inside and, and friends on the outside to see what the conductors would do trying to get to the back of the train. So we knew that they were gonna come after us, but it was just so funny. And we would say all sorts of different stuff as kids do. Um, so what we'd end up doing is we'd do that, we'd honk the horn, we'd use the PA, the train would stop, the conductor would come down, and we would open the window and just jump out the window of the train and run off, you know, down the tracks. So that was a story by request. Um, sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned earlier that I don't normally deal with software, and I do low-level programming and stuff, but that doesn't really count. Um, I was experimenting at one time with keyloggers on Unix systems, which are still very common, right? People hack Unix systems all the time. Um, I had a keylogger, and I think I had, I had written something, I had some piece of code, and I modified it to try to log people's keystrokes. Um, I went to a um, very prestigious technical university. I didn't go, I mean, I went there, I didn't attend. Um, went to this place, and one of their laboratories had computers for the, for the students, right, to use in computer labs. Um, this particular institution had a known root password, like it was a public thing. So this was still at a time where like sharing root access on systems was okay because it's all about trust and somebody not shooting in their own backyard. Um, but being me, I said, oh, I have root access. I'm gonna install keyloggers on all these machines so that I can get legitimate credentials from all of the students there. So I rode my bike down to this institution, um, ran these keyloggers on all these, all these computers and said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow and grab the log files. Because I didn't really have, I didn't have a lot of skill in like network side of things. So I'm like, all right, I'll just grab, I'll come back and physically get them off the computers. Come back the next day, the entire lab room where I had installed the key loggers, all the computers were down. Like I had crashed them all. And I'm like, okay, maybe I should just stick to hardware. <laughs> and I never got any of the, you know, any of the uh, accounts. So I was involved in a hacker group called Renegade Legion. Um, in my teenage years, and this was a group, we released a bunch of text files, so we were a group, but it was like, let's try to share information. The information we were sharing, though, wasn't like it is today, where like, um, you know, trying to, to fix things. It was mostly like, here's how you steal credit cards, here's how you break into credit bureau systems, here's how you, there was actually one on master, on, on ma creating a master key for master lock, um, here's how the different types of systems work. So it was all hacker-related info files. Um, we did some pretty crazy stuff, and I'll mention one thing later. There was also another group that I was involved in called Lost, which was really just making fun of our, fr our one of our friends. Um, that was the Renegade Legion guys, but we already had handles. We had fake names of doing our, our hacker, normal hacker stuff. And then this was like, we would just fuck with anybody. It was really bad. Um, new, new hacker kids that would come in and everything. And we were just, we were just a mess. Um, you can probably guess which one was me based on the names here, but I'll give you a hint. It says Skateboard Joe. 
Um, okay, so this, um, you know, like I mentioned, the mischief didn't didn't just take place on the phone lines or around the city. Um, I got involved in credit card fraud as well. And just like phones and free phone calls, like it didn't seem weird because it was this faceless, the way I justified it, it was like a faceless crime, like these big banks. The, the, the own credit card owners didn't get in trouble. So, I mean, they didn't have to pay. They weren't responsible. Just the big evil companies um, would front the cost. So it seemed to make sense. And this was before, like now, you know, identity theft and fraud, like it's a much bigger deal now because of organized crime involved and, and people that are, you know, have, their whole goal is to screw you and get as much, uh, you know, information. This was still, even though a lot of people were doing it, it was still very localized and sort of small. Um, but I had access to credit card numbers, like through the voicemail systems, and, and um, one other way that we would do it is through our modems, since we had access to credit bureaus, call up, dial up the credit bureau, and in those little books, I had passwords of the credit bureaus as they changed, and we would hack the passwords and guess them. Um, there was certain a certain way, a certain string you had to enter to query records. So we would look through the white pages and say, okay, who had the who would have a large credit rating or a large um, credit on their cards? Doctors, lawyers, dentists. So we would look through the white pages, that book with names in it, which I don't even know, does that exist anymore? I don't know. Um, we would look through those, find the names of those people, pull their credit record, get all the information about them, get their name, whatever their maiden name, you know, whatever stuff was in there. And then we would call the credit card company and say, uh, my name is Dr. whatever, Smith. Um, I'm going on vacation and I seem to have misplaced my credit card. Can you mail it to this address? So they would mail a new credit card to my drop site, my abandoned house or a neighbor who I knew was away. I'd get the credit card and then we'd go on a shopping spree or we'd use it online and, or not online, we'd use it over the phone get stuff delivered to the same drop site so the billing address matched. Um, or at least they knew that, that we were at this location for some amount of time on vacation and then we would get rid of the card. Um, and it's something where people can still do that, right? And like it, it shouldn't happen still anymore um, because I feel like the banks maybe should have learned 30 years ago or 20 years ago when mischievous kids were doing it, like maybe we should make it harder. Maybe a, a maiden name shouldn't be an identifier. Maybe we shouldn't use a social security number for everything. Uh, maybe we shouldn't just send out credit cards. But really, the banks don't actually give a shit because they want you to spend money and they want you to be in debt. So they're gonna happily issue new cards. And then if for some reason somebody notices new credit card charges and they complain, they just eat those costs. It's still a winning battle, it's like a casino where you know, sometimes they have to pay out, but they're gonna make money in the end. So it was just too easy to, to have that happen. Um, th this, was, take, this took place in one area, I was 15 or 16 or something, I can't believe how young I actually looked there, um, where this was an area that I hang out a lot, and um, we started recording our exploits, and instead of having phones, we had to have a, a video camera. How do you get the video camera? You use a credit card and you order one. I remember being on the phone with, a, with some video, audio video place, and I had really loved this Sony camera. It was like this beautiful box looking Sony camera from the 90s, I don't remember the name of it. So I went to order one over the phone, and the guy said, you know, we have this new one, it's a, whatever this company is, um, this one's way better. So he, he upsold me to a more expensive one. And I'm like, sure, I'll take that one. Um, so I ended up with this video camera. So I think it's sort of funny where I was, you know, obviously defrauding him, but then he was sort of trying to defraud me by upselling me, and uh, I guess he got screwed. No, actually, he didn't get screwed anyway. It was the, the credit card company. Um, anyway, so I got this, got the video camera, we started filming stuff. Um, this guy, I'm gonna call him Robert, because he looks like Robert Plant. That's, that wasn't his name, wasn't his handle. Um, we would spend a lot of time together, doing a lot, usually credit card types of stuff. We would hang out in this one location in Boston where we would hang out in this store, as you can see, and really annoy the people that worked there, and we just talked with them all the time, hours at a time. Um, across from this location were, was a bank of payphones, which was great for us to do all of our various types of, you know, calling people and, and harassing people. There was a little, a little store that sold like Moroccan trinkets from Morocco that this Moroccan guy owned, and he saw us messing around with the phone, and one day he came up to us, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm making some phone calls. So we ended up working out a deal where I would trade him free international phone calls to Morocco to get like Moroccan stuff. So, <laughs> so my room had like all this Moroccan, you know, incense holders and the bells and the hands and all this stuff. It was super cool. 
Um, but that's sort of where I learned early on that's like, oh, I can barter with people. I can trade my skills for other people's skills, which actually still happens today. Um, let's see, what other story? Oh yeah, so I, I, I had ordered a laptop once um, from a well-known computer company and shipped it to a friend of mine in a different state because he had a good, he had good access to like a drop site. Um, so he, 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 we had it delivered there. He was gonna test it before he sent it to me. And I talked to him on the phone, he's like, I couldn't believe how long it took to test all the RAM when I powered it up. It had eight megs of RAM, eight megabytes of RAM. And that was a huge thing. Um, he ended up actually getting arrested for credit card stuff, too bad. Um, and then speaking of being awkward with girls, uh, so Robert here had a, a crush on somebody who worked at a record store across the hall from, from here. So instead of just like going and, and being yourself and communicating, he said, let's order 12 dozen roses to her at work. So we, we used a credit card and ordered 144 roses and the delivery guy was walking, you know, with one dozen at a time up the ramp to put them all on the, uh, on the counter of the checkout counter and it was like, it was awesome. I wish I had pictures of it. Um, so anyway, yeah, this is, this is all ridiculous stuff. So being into hardware, um, this thing up here, this is the, uh, that's the uh, Ring Busy device. When I was messing around with cell phones, I needed a way to extract the memory contents from the phone where the ESN and MIN were stored so I could figure out how I could change those. Um, I, so I, I didn't have access to a device programmer, which is like a general type of tool you can get now to do it. So I built my own and I would just manually cycle through every single address of the, of the contents of the memory. Down here was sort of some experimenting with uh, creating a multi-frequency generator because with a lot of the phone freaking stuff, you would need to generate certain tones. You had your DTMF tones, but then you had your multi-frequency, just MF tones that were the ones that you would use for the in-band signaling to control where you're going in the system. So blue box type of stuff here. Um, here's one of my little beige boxes that I would use as my lineman handset. So instead of having a legitimate orange lineman handset, I could just plug a normal phone into this, connect these to two phone lines in this case. This was a little conference call system, so I could have a little conference call on my own, just clipping onto phone lines. Um, this one down here, who had a pager back in the day? Yeah, a few people. This was a red box in a pager, and a red box is a, is a device that would generate the, the tones that a coin would generate when you put it into a payphone. So I don't know if you remember, like you put a dime in the payphone, it would go beep beep, or you put a quarter in it, it would go beep beep and do five beeps. So this just created those tones, and because all of that signaling was, was called in band, uh, all you had to do is have your red box hold it up to the phone when it said, please enter 70, please deposit 75 cents. You'd hold this thing up, you'd push the buttons corresponding to 75 cents, and then you would get your phone call. I sold those a lot too, that was also very profitable. Oh, I should mention, um, I've always been into buying and selling stuff, and my parents just reminded me of this. So when I was a little bit older, I discovered an AT&T dumpster, a junkyard that was all discarded AT&T equipment. And I pulled out all the EEPROMs from the different types of telephone equipment. And EEPROMs at the time, they're programmable memory devices and they're used in all sorts of arcade games and stuff like that. Um, not anymore, because it's an older technology, but I had dozens and dozens of those that I would sell on Usenet. So selling stuff has always been kind of popular. When I was younger, when I was about 10, I had discovered like an adult bulletin board system and uh, that was a local number. And so of course I signed up with a friend of mine and we pretended to be older and we set our your birthday to something that seemed really old. And you could download ASCII art of naked women. <laughs> They're probably naked men too, but I, I, don't, I didn't see that. Um, so I would have these printouts and it was dot matrix printout, you know, ASCII dot matrix on a, on a piece of paper with, the, um, with the, the paper on the sides, whatever it's called, tractor feed. So I had these printouts of naked ladies. I had them under my bed. Um, but I ended up selling those at school, which was one of my first endeavors of, of selling things, uh, which was awesome, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, what else? Um, this one here is a universal garage door opener. So this system is uh, just based on, it has 10 dip switches that you would set for your transmit password that would match the receiver. And I said, well, wait, what if I just replace that with a circuit that will cycle through all of them automatically? So you just hold the button down, it will open any garage door that uses that system which is like a precursor to doing it wire with wireless exploits through software-defined radio. With Sammy Comcar did uh, something recently that basically emulated this attack plus a whole bunch of other ones of other systems to have this universal garage door opener system. So just because you can do it doesn't mean it's illegal. I didn't actually take advantage of that. I ended up showing it to my parents and they said, okay, good job. Um, but they moved their bikes out of the garage. So at least that was you know, a good thing. And then other mischievous stuff like this generated a, a really high frequency sound which high frequency bounces all over the place. So I would bring this into school, in high school, turn it on, close it, it was a Sucrets box, so like, a, like an Altoid sort of thing. 
um, leave it on the desk and you know have some tissues to pretend I was sick. And the teacher would be like, what is that sound? And look all over the place and i just sit there, it was awesome. Um, this is a laser listener that I thought would be cool to spy on people. Um, and uh, so I created this to try to spy on people. This was a credit card copier. Um, and of course with all of this stuff, something was bound to happen, right? So eventually the hammer came down on me and um, I ended up getting arrested. This pic picture, by the way, like I normally smile a lot if you haven't noticed. The police told me not to smile because it wasn't funny um, <laughs> when I got arrested. So this was not the first picture that they took. Um, so it was, it actually, it, it was, uh, I got very lucky. This was a turning point for me. And um, I ended up flying to Michigan to hang out with some of the guys from Renegade Legion. So hacker group that normally we messed around on the phones, now we're in person. Um, being a parent now, I have no idea why my parents let me do that. Um, they were very open with what I was doing. And uh, so I ended up going to Michigan. We thought it'd be fun to break into a Michigan Bell telephone facility to steal information. And it was all, again, about that information of having like, how can we do things on the phone networks? How can we have hardware that we're not supposed to have? Um, we ultimately were charged with six felonies each. Um, they dropped the charges on me because I was the only juvenile. So this was the point where I was like, shit, I should probably stop doing this. Um, the other guy's not so lucky. I ended up going back about a year ago. I was doing some work out there and stopped by the uh, telephone company, took a picture, and it was really eerie to be back there 25 years later. And then it was so cold in Detroit that my, um, my cell phone died. So I was like, shit. So I followed the signs to the police station. And I was like, this is where I got arrested. Went into the police station, my palms got sweaty. I'm like, oh my God, they're gonna recognize me. Because um, I had to ask for directions to get back to the airport. And they didn't. So anyway, I only have a few minutes. And this is really like, all that bad stuff um, were experiences that kind of paved where I ended up. And um, I had to do a sport or get a job, according to my parents. And uh, so I ended up running, which became a saving grace for me because now I, would, I could kind of, that was my balance of using computers and then running. So that was really good. I ended up joining The Loft, which was a hacker group in Boston with a bunch of older guys that were really focused on sharing information in a good way and using the hacker name to spread the good side of what we can do, the positivity of it. Um, without breaking the law. So they, I had known them beforehand. There's a lot of history about the loft that's already online. Um, I had known them before that, but they're like, we don't want him to join until he's done doing his dumb shit. And they were right. So I got in trouble, joined the loft. I won't play the video. You can see it online because we don't have time, but it was a hacker hangout to mess around with stuff. Not unlike makerspaces today. Um, so we got a lot of, of, of media coverage about trying to share what hackers can do from the good side which you should all understand being at a hacker conference. We ended up testifying in front of Senate in 1998 about the state of computer security and government. That is, of course, not real. Um, that was in the White House press room, though. I do want to play this as, as sort of the final thing um, because it's pretty funny. This was Conan O'Brien the day after our Senate testimony, and uh, he had heard about it and said, okay, let's make fun of hackers because who doesn't make fun of hackers? It's kind of weird. I found this. Talk about something that's a little frightening. I read this in the news yesterday. A group of computer hackers told Congress that hackers are now capable of shutting down the internet, redirecting commercial flights, and transferring millions of Wall Street dollars around the world. It's weird, yeah, which means the only thing hackers still aren't capable of doing is losing their virginity. <laughs> and, uh... There's a guy with thick black glasses crying right now in the third row. And, and yeah. moving all the money out of your account. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm completely screwed. Yeah. Well, show that red-haired freak. I don't fear nerds. Uh, that's the bravest stand I ever took. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I might be going out on a limb here, but I don't fear the nerds. Yeah, okay, so uh, that, um, I should mention that this, this was 1998. So this is just when the internet was becoming, you know, common. People were starting to discover technology. Um, and we were really at that point trying to show how bad computer security was at the time. And has it changed since then? No. Um, I'm going to skip through this. I also ended up doing a TV show called Prototype This, which was an opportunity now to share my love of electronics without fucking with people, but teaching them how to do it and how to build crazy projects. So it really is something 
you know, that ended up being positive. Of course, designing the DEF CON badges, the first electronic badges at conferences, um, other sorts of stuff. Chumbi was like the first open source hackable hardware thing. So it's, again, just turning that energy into something positive ended up being my career. Like, this is what I do. I live it. I've lived it my whole life. Um, the technology has changed, but like, I still am always thinking about things and always questioning and always, um, you know, trying to trying to find a way to push somebody's buttons and how can how can I teach people things and like it really is just, um, you know, it's just something that I've done. Uh, so yeah, even though technology has changed, now there's this technical the the criminal more organized criminal element to it, but there's still plenty of stuff to hack, right? Like we're doing retro stuff here, but even with the newer things, there's stuff you can do, um, and just not hopefully get get arrested for it. Um, I would say like the hacker mindset is still here where. The most important thing that we can do is kind of use, use our passion, so do what we love to do, but then teach, I think, teach critical thinking skills and teach the fact of questioning our world to kids, to this next generation, because we sort of already have our minds kind of made up, but a lot of kids these days, I have two of them, and they're in the school system, and I can see that, you know, they need to learn to not trust everything that they read. They need to learn to not trust everything they see. They need to question on their own and experiment. So I feel like that's our main responsibility as hackers is to learn stuff on our own, but then teach other people to question stuff because that's going to be the most important thing. Because I know that I want my kids to be able to critically think about stuff and not go down the path I did, but learn that, okay, I don't, I don't, really, I don't really trust what this guy's saying. I want to learn it on my own or I want to figure it out. And like, I think that's really important. And that's what the hacker community is to me all about. Um, yeah, so, and again, you know, the history, I feel like everybody has a story. I just saw Hamilton recently, and it, there was like one song at the end, everyone's bawling at the end because it was so sad. Um, but it's, the, the song is called Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story? And Hamilton had this amazing story, and his wife spent like 50 years after his death documenting everything and sharing. And if we don't document our history of these early days, it's going to be lost because it was before data was harvested by everybody, right? It was like this time where it almost... It almost doesn't exist unless people talk about it. So please tell your stories at other conferences and, and sort of share this stuff. Um, and of course, you know, this is all like, my, these are mistakes from my past. I, maybe some of them were mistakes. I, okay, the carelessness of youth, I guess. Um, but I wouldn't have changed anything because it sort of got me you know, where I am. I just have to apologize to my parents for dragging them through this. Um, so yes, thank you again. Sorry, I'm a little over. So we'll add, take questions elsewhere. Um, but thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference.